Ah, hello, friends. Sitting down for that big turkey dinner? Or in another time zone, are you recovering from that bigger slice of pumpkin pie that you thought you could devour before getting halfway through? <laughs> Regardless of whether you're rubbing your sore tummy or preparing to get one, I hope you settle in and enjoy these scary, unsettling, and true Thanksgiving stories that I'll tell you around the campfire. Gather round, friends, gather round. It is a wonderful autumn night. You can hear that sort of crisp howl in the wind, the crackle of the fire. Utterly delightful, yes, yes. Or perhaps not utterly delightful for some of you. Some of you may think that Thanksgiving evening is just a bit crazy, with all the sort of familial indulgences. If you are such a person, well then you will enjoy this first story I shall read you, by Wonder Are Not Lost, Crazy Thanksgiving Night. So I'm a large nurse at a male hospital in San Francisco. I work in the ER, and as is custom, Thanksgiving night was very busy. Now, my wife is also a nurse for the same hospital. She works in labor and delivery. Between babies being born left and right, and the people coming into the ER, we hadn't really had a chance to take a break together, as we try to do every shift. When she called, I figured it was to say she wanted to meet up for a bite to eat in the cafeteria. When I answered, I heard in the background a male voice screaming profanities in the background, and my wife, who is fluent in Spanish, trying to calm this guy down. She told me their pager wasn't working, and they needed a security stat. I quickly hung up and called for security, told my fellow nurses what was going on, and ran for labor and delivery, worried sick about my wife, when I almost ran smack dab into this visibly angry man. He wasn't huge, but my goodness definitely worked out and not at the gym. He was covered in prison tattoos, and he was obviously a banger. I work out regularly, but I knew this guy could really kick my rear end. He looked at me, gave me this sick grin, and started heading towards me, spouting off in Spanish. I don't speak fluent Spanish, but what I could understand scared the living heck out of me. I was backing up as fast as I could. I started buzzing the door to the ER frantically for them to let me in. This guy literally was a foot away from me, and the door finally opened, and thankfully I was pulled into safety by another doctor. The gangbanger punched the door a few times, making a dragging sign across his throat while grinning at us both. Next thing I knew, the police rushed into the corridor he was in, and it took two security officers and two cops to subdue this man. I finally made it to my wife, who thankfully was shaken, but unhurt. She explained to me what happened. A young girl, only fourteen, came in, high fever, vomiting, distended belly. The banger claimed he was her brother, and they needed to cut her open to get her baby. They did an ultrasound first, thankfully, and to their horror they realized she wasn't pregnant. Instead, she had bags and bags of narcotics in her stomach. Sadly, it's very common for drug mules to bring over their young women from Mexico carrying drugs that way. The man freaked out when they informed him his sister needed emergency surgery. And no, he wasn't getting his narcotics. Thankfully on this Thanksgiving, the girl survived, but the sad thing was she would most likely be getting deported once she recovered. My goodness, friends, not what you thought the first story would be. About turkeys and pumpkin pie and stuffing and cranberry sauce, well, an aching belly certainly is not an enviable thing on Thanksgiving, at least for some. But compared to that, friends, I think your Thanksgiving likely has been put into perspective. 
I think before we contemplate that Thanksgiving further, we best get on to our next Thanksgiving story, friends. I mean, who doesn't feel generous on Thanksgiving, especially when you're around family, friends, bringing your special dish to the table, as well as sampling those brought by others just for your grateful indulgence. I think this story suits the topic at hand by J. Persnickett. I was feeling generous on Thanksgiving. I've been lurking on this sub for a while and wanted to share my story. It was Thanksgiving 2019 and I was celebrating at my grandparents' farm in the little town of Seville, Florida. It's north of Deland. I had had way too much to eat that holiday and was about to leave to drive back to school in Tallahassee. I stopped at one little gas station in town to fill up before getting back on the highway. I had just finished filling up when a lady walked up to me. She was really ratty looking with crazy blonde dyed hair, but this was backwoods Florida, so no judgment. There were really kind people who looked like that in those parts. She started talking to me about how her car had run out of gas. She then pointed to an old junker parked over near the convenience store, and if I could possibly give her some cash to get home. I usually don't say yes to things like that, but it was a Thanksgiving weekend, so I was feeling extra generous. I told her that I'd be happy to fill up her car a little to get her home. Then it started getting weird. She kept insisting I give her cash and that the car was so empty she couldn't drive it to the pump. I don't know why I didn't leave right there and then, but once again I was in a kind and very generous mood. I suppose generosity has a dulling effect. I told her that if she had a gas can I would put some in, but I didn't feel comfortable in giving her straight cash. She kept objecting, but eventually went over and pulled a gas can from her car. I started filling it up. She put her hand on me then and said, Do you have a girlfriend? I told her no politely. She said she wanted to pay me back somehow for the gas and asked if I wanted to come to her place. I told her no less politely but she kept touching my shoulder, thanking me, and then offering me a sexual favor behind the station. I immediately stopped the gas pump at that point, ran to my car, got in, and left her standing there, half full gas can in hand. I called my mom a little later and told her about the creepy, sleazy encounter. She paused and asked me if this lady had ratty, blonde hair and looked like she was on narcotics. I confirmed that yes, that was what she looked like, and then I asked my mother how she even knew that. Then my mother told me the story. This lady was apparently all over the news. She was a hooker in town and had been at a party earlier. An exchange had gone south, and her baby had been kidnapped by a client of theirs and left under a bush in town. She hadn't even bothered to call the police about the missing child, at least until later. They were both then arrested and charged. I got off the phone aghast, hardly able to believe that this had been the conclusion of my thanksgiving. For those older among my listeners, we've all gone through a few thanksgivings, haven't we? <laughs> Not all of them are memorable, at least in the same happy way. I hope, though, however unmemorable some of your thanksgivings have been and will be, that they weren't that unmemorable, friends. As everyone knows, Thanksgiving is a time to spend around friends and family, not just anyone. However, in this upcoming story, friends, Family and friends are not who this person spent their time with. I present to you Graka's The Mini Cult, or how I spent my Thanksgiving break.
My friend Connor has a girlfriend who lives a few hours away, and her mum reads all her texts. Naturally, they generally stick to Skype. Well, after a while, his girlfriend, named Ellie, name changed to protect her privacy of course, wanted to introduce him to her Skype friends. This was a group of people who met in various places across the internet, who incidentally have those awful clusterfuck chats you can't even keep up with. She introduced him to this fellow named Jack. Jack was at the epicenter of the group, apparently. Connor mentioned him to me in passing a few times over about a month, and then he finally messaged me one night and said, I need to talk to you. So we talked, and he told me what Jack had been saying. Jack is what I like to refer to as a liar. Crazy, legit, pathological liar. And I estimate the odds of each of those at 49 to 50 to 1. See, Jack claimed of all things to be a supernatural being, which I'd normally laugh off of course, except he'd got a group of hapless people utterly convinced of this, and Connor described the group dynamics and its red flags all around for controlling behavior. And, well, it's sort of my specialty, that is dealing with people like Jack. But Connor didn't want me to stir up trouble, because he's a very non-confrontational sort of person. I don't have similar inhibitions. So one night, Connor invited me into the group, which was ominously dubbed The Truth. Cults have a collective belief in varying levels, in something at least. In this case, the truth about Jack. The first thing anyone said to me was, Did you get Jack's permission? Every alarm bell in my system went off at that point. Connor and I both played dumb. Slowly, hesitantly, a few others of the group, all strangers to me, started introducing themselves by saying hello. Not welcoming me, please don't assume that. Not asking how I knew Connor. Not even trying to explain that the chat was kind of private. Just saying tentative hellos. The girl who first demanded to know if Jack gave me permission to join announced that she asked Jack if I was allowed to stay. Connor, meanwhile, was messaging me about the group dynamics. The only non-believer Connor knew of was King, who was vocal about his problems with Jack. I spoke with King, who told me that the other person who didn't believe was a girl who challenged me about entering the group. Red flag number one. Someone who doesn't believe Jack was still the first to challenge outsiders? Uh, cults that don't appreciate outsiders. That was about when Jack arrived. He was likable, don't get me wrong. He was good at what he did. I think for about 30 minutes that he was too good for me to be of any use. But I'm a writer, so I can commit to a character pretty well better than most, and he bought the act of my being a southern belle. Once he invited me to a private chat, I immediately told him that I could ask him anything without fear of repercussions. The dude lived 600 miles from me apparently, what the fuck kind of repercussions could there be? So I talked to the king and the girl, who challenged me again. It turned out that he was dealing with someone else that had been in the cult. He was using threats and fear to get people to obey him. Something about being sold into magical slavery if he didn't protect them. I'm going to pause here to say, the people who don't believe in Jack are the most emotionally stable ones. They are abuse victims and depressed teenagers in this little group. They're smart, but they have two options, believe Jack or lose their friends. Anyway, back to the circle of creepy. Jack's Skype mood was going to kill my brother. Naturally, I inquired. He told me that his brother stabbed him with a sword and sided with their father, whom Jack hated with a deep passion. Half of this guy lore comes from the Dresden Files, I swear. <laughs> For a creepy would-be cult leader, he really sucked at lying. 
so I marked him down for a dysfunctional IRL family and possible violent tendencies. Then I lured Jack into a trap. I won't bore you with the details, but I got an irrevocable screenshotted proof that he was a lying liar who lies. Not delusional and not legit. Then I let Jack know the jig was up. His retaliation? He decided that he should ban me and Connor from the group, but before he could, I got off a nice little tangent into the group chat about a Criminal Minds episode where a cult leader kicks out anyone who challenges him lest others be swayed. Jack was really ticked at me. Really ticked. Like, hope this MRF can't trace my IP address or I'm dead ticked. But it didn't end there. Oh no. Jack returned to this little group chat with a sob story, and I let him stew, because I've slowly been working my way through the group, ripping off Jack is a liar who lies and manipulates, and you really shouldn't tell this guy your real name. No, really. Band-Aid. I went to talk to King, who told me that his fellow non-believer, Challenger, had a picture of Jack's ID. Well, this was too good to be true. Because I believe in having leverage, I did some totally legit digging into this guy, who has an unfortunately unique surname. Dear Jack's mum, you should change your Facebook security settings. Some fun facts about this fellow Jack. His little brother is a jock, better looking, mesomorph body, athletic, and popular. Jack, of course, is none of these things. His mum stopped talking about her eldest son quite suddenly. No more pictures of Jack. Not a single mention since Jack was 18. So I made note of it and moved on with my background check. But then I noticed something. An arrest. Not unusual. Except before the arrest date, he and his brother were equally pictured on their mum's Facebook. And then nothing. I can't figure it out until I'm talking to Jack, distracting him and letting him talk to himself in circles. I saw his mood again, gonna kill his brother. Dear gods, remembering that every single lie holds a kernel of truth. He actually had a brother that he wanted to kill. I asked him why he was arrested, even though I felt in my gut that I was right. Assault he said. On whom? <laughs> on my brother. I needed confirmation on a few other things before I presented the facts to the group, still called the truth. Even as more and more members sat behind their computers, marveling at the irony. So I kept talking to him to make sure that I had the right Jack, that I wasn't dealing with a catfish creep. This time, we even video chatted. And it was him, mugshot and ID confirmed. He kept asking me questions, like where did I live, north of you, what did I do for a living, consultant, how old was I, 17, and what was my name, hell no. I, like Jack, have one of those last names that is incredibly rare. He could find it if he googled me. At any point, Jack could do five minutes of googling and find my name first. First, middle, and last. Anyway, I told the group chat that Jack was lying that day and shut down his manipulative attempts to garner sympathy. Funny thing is, now he says he's dying and his father's a mobster and his brother is his adoptive brother. Except, there's no one around for this equally nonsense story. He's trying to convince me. Just me. You know, over the years, friends, I've heard from people one or two very peculiar ways to spend a Thanksgiving. But in truth, friends, this one takes the cake. Confirmed, verified true. I don't believe I'll be spending my Thanksgiving online, least of all talking to someone with the nature of Jack. 
If I do spend any time online, of course it would be interacting with you. Live streaming, chatting. <laughs> I certainly hope you enjoyed that true story, friends, the longest featured on this audiobook. Hear the leaves rustling, friends? The forest wind around us? High, cold, and cruel? Hmm, let us gather around the fire closer, friends. Share this pumpkin pie that I happen to bring. <laughs> One of many. And no, no rhubarb, no mincemeat. Unfortunately, Grobly ate all of those. I was only able to rescue the pumpkins because he happens to be allergic to the pumpkin spices of nutmeg, allspice, and cloves. And get ready for our next true scary story. This was a strange encounter. It was very scary at the time, but when I tell people this story, they usually don't think it was something to freak out about. Last Thanksgiving, I was driving home from college with my friend, both 21-year-old females at the time. I lived in a very isolated part of Arkansas that required driving through an hour of hairpin turns in the mountains. There are lots of blind turns, and the whole time you're driving on the edge of huge drop-offs with no barriers. I'm usually pretty confident driving through the mountains, but we were in my friend's car, so I was going slower than usual, driving about five over the speed limit. Almost as soon as we started the roughest part of the drive, another car was tailgating us pretty close. This was stressing me out, and as soon as I saw somewhere I could pull over, I did. I pulled into a church parking lot, and my friend offered to drive the rest of the way, but I declined as it was completely dark, and she had never driven this route before. We got back on our way, and a few minutes later, I had to come to a screeching halt, as there was a car stopped in the middle of the road. It wasn't on the shoulder at all, just stopped dead in the middle of the road. My friend was saying that they must have broken down, but I couldn't call a tow because there was no service in the area. I immediately had a bad feeling and locked all the doors. I told my friend to stay in the car, no matter what. She started to get scared at this point and noted to me that she thought it was the car that had been following us earlier. I couldn't tell, but I was very scared at this point. It was parked right before a hairpin turn, so I couldn't pass it, at least without risking my own car. My friend started frantically telling me to go ahead and pass it, but I didn't want to risk it and get hit by a truck or fall off the edge of the mountain. I honked my horn instead, but nothing happened. No chance of calling for help, as I mentioned, since there was no cellular service. We waited there for a long time, doing absolutely nothing. My friend began crying and freaking out, and I too was beginning to get scared and wanting to try and pass them. I honked a couple of times more, and eventually a guy got out of the car, came around back, and leaned against his car, just staring at the two of us. My friend was freaking out even more, and I was just frozen. I told her not to make eye contact. I was ready to floor it if he did anything. I tried to stay calm and pray that another car would come along soon. This went on for what seemed like forever, but it was probably only fifteen minutes. The man was just casually leaning against his car, still looking at us. Eventually, we saw car lights in our rearview mirror, and then the guy jogged to his door and quickly got back into his vehicle. He sped off shortly after that, going what seemed dangerously fast. So there was nothing wrong with his car as I had assumed. I started driving too, not wanting to cause a wreck myself. We didn't see anything else for a while, but we passed the same car parking on the highway a while later, and it had pulled back on 
and started tailing us again. I tried to speed up to get rid of him, but he kept following. We fortunately had cell service at this point, but I didn't know if we should call the cops because nothing really happened. Maybe it was all in my head. I called home and told my brother what was going on and told them to wait on the porch for us. The car followed me all the way home, down the really long drive to my house, too. Once I got to my house, I saw my two brothers were waiting on the porch, holding their deer rifles. I pulled in, and the car just went to the end of the drive, looped back around, and sped off down the way it came. We tried to see its plates, but we were too far away, so we couldn't make them out. Me and my friend were really freaked out, but when we told other friends the whole story, they didn't really think it was a big deal. My, my, friends. Crazy road and an even crazier driver. Stopping in the middle, parking on the entrance of a switchback, I certainly wish all of you a safe Thanksgiving, especially those of you driving home for it. As everybody knows, the focus on Thanksgiving often is family and friends. <laughs> Actually, what am I saying? It's usually family and friends. That, and of course the food. We rarely think of our neighbors on Thanksgiving, at least unless they are our friends. As this next story shall demonstrate friends, you may not be thinking of your neighbors this Thanksgiving, but that doesn't mean your neighbors are the right kind of people and won't do something to upset or try to upset your special holiday, as is the case in Spooky Dolls, Crazy Neighbors. My boyfriend and I have lived in the same apartment for about two years now, our building is a very old house, probably built over a hundred years ago, that was converted into four separate units. We live on the ground floor. Our apartment is on the far right side of the building, and you walk up this little walk and up some steps to a small stoop to get to our unit. To get to the upstairs apartments, you need to go up to the main front porch, to the main front door, and there are two doorbells you can ring depending on which unit you want. Okay, so much for the backstory. This is about the neighbors directly above us. My boyfriend and I work third shift, so we never interact much with our neighbors since we're asleep during the day. All we knew about our upstairs neighbors were that they were a young heterosexual couple like us, and that they had moved in just before Thanksgiving in November. Also, the girls seemed to enjoy blasting Lana Del Rey at nine in the morning when we were trying to sleep, but that's another story. So, two weeks ago, on Friday night, my boyfriend and I were napping. We woke up at midnight to our neighbors arguing and screaming at each other. We listened to their shouts briefly because we're nosy, but we quickly became bored and went to watch TV and ignore them. We had never heard these people be loud or anything before at this point, so we didn't really care about sudden noise or anything now and assumed the fight would run its course. At 2 a.m. though, we heard a loud smash, then glass breaking. We looked out our window by our front door and saw glass and the frame of a window littered on our walkway. My boyfriend went outside and looked up and saw the couple upstairs somehow had broke one of their windows. At this point, we were pretty concerned, so I called the cops. The cops arrived soon after and came to our door thinking it was us acting out. <laughs> My boyfriend quickly explained it was the people above us, so the cops got in the main front porch and rang the doorbell. Not the first time cops got the wrong address, am I right? The girl above us came downstairs. I was creeping on the situation from our bedroom window, which faces the front porch. I couldn't see the front door or what was happening, but I could hear everything being said. 
I heard the police announce themselves, and the girl tried shutting the door on them. I heard her say, Oh, you're going to grab me? Then I heard a cop scream, You're going to jail! And the girl was then pinned face down on the porch and handcuffed. She immediately started crying about getting her life back on track and having these jobs lined up. The same sort of stuff you hear on cops TV, funnily enough. Then the boyfriend came downstairs and talked to the cops. I couldn't hear them over the girl screaming and crying, but after about ten minutes the cops lifted the girl up off the ground and I could hear them leading her to a police van to take her to jail. At this point, she went full crazy, even crazier than before, and started screaming her head off at the top of her lungs. She didn't stop screaming for about 15 minutes. Finally, after the cops looked at the broken window and finished their reports, they left with Miss Crazy. <sighs> I know that this isn't really creepy or anything, but it was, like I said, an episode of Cops. Things like that don't happen in our neighborhood. Never happened before and never happened since. Pretty weird for a Thanksgiving. Usually it's families that end up fighting so much of the time, but this time it was our crazy neighbors. <laughs> Indeed, friends. I certainly hope you don't have neighbors as crazy as that. Not that it's bad to have the police visit your neighborhood, at least the day before Thanksgiving, when you can celebrate and appreciate law enforcement. But God, one does not want the police on Thanksgiving Day, let alone arresting such a noisemaker as that girl. And on that note, friends, I shall let all of you retire to your abodes, your apartments, or even your caverns to cannibalize, I, I mean, to indulge in the festivities and foods of Thanksgiving. I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, friends. I certainly am grateful for all of you, and of course the usual things like my family, food, comfort, roof over my undead head. <laughs> And of course about the little things, like my patrons, 28 of them so far, or so it fluctuates, on Patreon. I'm especially grateful for you helping me at this time when, amid all this YouTube craziness, gearing up again for a crazy January when YouTube implements these COPPA changes. Speaking of which, if you would like to show me the gift of gratitude, I encourage you to check out my Patreon account. The links are in every video description that I've literally ever made, as well as there being links to it on my channel page. Just search the bottom right of my channel banner. Happy Thanksgiving again, friends, and I'll see you again next month for creepy Christmas stories, creepy horror stories to fall asleep to, and much more.